and welcome to another edition of the Paranormal Concept Show, exclusive to the PAUK Radio Network. I'm your brilliant host, Paul Rook, and tonight we're joined in the studio by the stupendous Kerry Greenaway and Richard Clements. Hello, guys. <laughs> Very modest brilliant. host, Paul Rook. <laughs> you know what? Every week I just say, I'm your host, Paul Rook, and I don't get none of this stupendous thing, so I thought, you know what? Tonight I'm going to go for brilliant. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> exactly. Someone's got to keep people entertained, don't they? And that, and that should get them all going on social media. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you don't blow your own trumpet, who will blow it for you? Is what I say. Well, yeah, true. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not even going to raise a joke about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I know where your brain went. That's the worst <laughs> bit about it. That's the worst <laughs> bit about that comment. Is I know exactly where your head went. No, you don't. Yes, I do. <laughs> I've known you a long time. So how have you been anyway? Kerry, I, I know you went out for, um, for a day trip, didn't you? Went to the Tower of London. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. We've done a show on the Tower of London, everybody, so go check that out. Um, because it's absolutely fascinating place. Loads and loads of history, piled upon, piled upon, piled upon history in there. The only trouble is, if you go as a visitor, like a tourist, there are so many people around that it is, is, yeah, yeah. you can't pick up anything because, you know, there are just too many people around. And I'm not that great at tuning out other people's energies. So, um, (laughs) although I have to say, I've been there when it's been busier. Yeah. But it's just fascinating and seeing like the ravens were really active and talking to people and, you know, like um, coming right up to people. And that was funny. Um, it was just a really good day out. And at the moment, they've got the moat that has been planted with loads of meadow flowers. Um, oh, yeah, the tower in bloom, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Really pretty. Really pretty. I would say you wouldn't necessarily, unless you want to close up and personal with the flowers, you don't need to go into it because you can see it from the walkway. Yeah. You know, as you walk around, you can see it. Um, and it is beautiful. It, they've done it really, really well, which they, they do. They do things. Well, like they have that. to, don't they? They do, yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, we had a lovely day out. It was really hot. Oh, did you go and see all the suits of armour and everything? Of course. <laughs> I yes, I saw that, yeah. And mm-hmm. what do you think of Henry VIII's uh, mm-hmm. codpiece? All I'm going to say is there's a lot of little man syndrome going on there. <laughs> Carrie Ann, who I went with um, from Equilibrium Paranormal, she's been coming out with us a bit recently. Um, she took a side view. And there's everybody's like looking at this armour, and me and her are actually in fits. We're like crying with laughter about it. And um, she's like, I've got to get a side view of that. She's going, it was looking at us really disgustedly. But I didn't care. I had a really good day. We yeah. had a lot, a lot of fun. The other thing we did was it was summer solstice last week. Oh, yes. <laughs> we went to the woods. We went to the woods, didn't we? Again, we carried out what? I actually watched a documentary um, about witchcraft. Mm-hmm. And they said that in this particular witchcraft scenario, they um, christened a cat and then attached parts of a dead man to the cat as part of the ritual. Okay. So when you was doing your live, I, I think I actually commented on it and just said, like, I, I watched this documentary, so run, Richard, run. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I saw that. <laughs> I will it say, was... I have got gnat bites everywhere. Have you? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I, was they bitten, don't. I was bitten to shreds on that night. I've got gnat bites everywhere. Literally, I've got about 20 gnat bites. Mm. Did you get any, Richard? No. No, I think must have, I must have very sweet blood at the moment. Yeah, you must do. Yes, it's all like I, I didn't get any either. <laughs> Did you not? Paul? No, no, I'm covered in them. I'm scratchy. Oh, right. Scratchy girl at the moment, and just mentioning them makes me itch, which is really annoying. So yeah, I stink a TCP at the moment because I'm covered in them. And where <laughs> it's been hot, they've just done nothing but itch. So it's. Oh, heavy. right. We did a really interesting ritual in the woods. Some really interesting things came out. Um, of that particular ritual we were doing a seance around it and even Richard said it felt like the woods were like closing in around us yeah it did yeah we sort of uh yeah Kerry done a witchy thing Mm -hmm. which was quite interesting in itself some meditation 
And uh, yeah, it's quite nice to go but down to the, the place woods. You actually done it was Hockley Woods, wasn't it? And that, it was. Yeah. And that woodland dates back to the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. It talking? does. It's an ancient one. Years, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was really weird was after post ritual, we've cleaned up, tidied up our area. Obviously, didn't damage anything in the process, and uh, left offerings. And then as we were walking away, I saw something really strange. Now it could easily have been an animal. Right. Could have been an animal. Yeah. The sceptical perspective would be, yes, I didn't capture it on camera. It moved too quick. There are deer in that forest. We know that. Yeah. Um, and obviously there'll be foxes and badgers and squirrels and stuff. But it was humanoid figure. And it moved really quickly. And it was black. Mm. Well, was it on two legs? Yeah, it looked it to me. Or Bigfoot? No, maybe not a Bigfoot. Little, it wasn't that big. A little foot. A little foot will go. A little foot will go. Really, but that yeah. was interesting as we were like trying to, and it felt like after the ritual, after we'd done that and we tied it up, it felt like it was unrecognisable. We'd, we'd come in to the, where we'd done it and what yeah. looked like quite an obvious path, Richard, wasn't it? Well, yeah. It's sort of, yeah, the usual thing that happens to us. We get lost, basically. And got to, it felt like we'd been turned around quite a lot in in the woods. And we found our way out, obviously, pretty relatively easily. But yeah, it's not the it's, only experience we've had in the woods, is it? No. When we went to Clapham. Clapham Wood, yeah. It was another strange experience, which um, we was with Andy Mercer and Penny Griffiths Morgan that night. And uh, that that whole night was a little weird. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, out of all the woodland trips you've been on, I think I've only been into the woods once with you you two. Mm. And after that experience, I never want to do it again. <laughs> that was Rendlesham. That was Rendlesham Forest, yeah. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> we we nearly was on the him. hunt for the, for the UFO, weren't we? Yes. <laughs> we were. We nearly killed poor Paul Rook that <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah, at, at the time I was suffering from major slip disc and um, I was on crutches, wasn't I? You was. How you and, did it, I... Keto. And you was like, well, you was like halfway round. Are you okay? Well, I'm gonna have to be because I'm halfway round now. <laughs> we didn't have a clue where we were either. It's no. Like, yeah, how do we call the emergency services? Where are you? Well, we're in the middle of a woods. Yeah, <laughs> we're yeah. abouts in the woods. Well, we're in Rendlesham. Yeah, uh, Rendlesham Forest. A tree on the left. Yeah, you know, found him a bench, made him sit down for five minutes, literally five minutes. Yeah. Of all and the woodlands we... we visit, I mean, yeah. Rendlesham's got to be the biggest. By no, far. Yeah. yeah. And then when we made it back to the car, I was like, <laughs> I could bring out my clothes easily. Um and then yeah, you you three went off into the woods to find this UFO statue thing, mm -hmm. left me in the car park, and then some weird <laughs> parked up. <laughs> I locked the doors and I rang a mate of mine, you know, just to make sure I weren't murdered. <laughs> it is one of the weirdest things that happen it, th weird things happen when we go to the woods which is kind yeah. of one of the reasons we like going to the woods so much Absolutely. stuff happens yeah because stuff always happens weird stuff always happens yeah when we go to the woods which is again i'll reiterate this is one of the reasons we like going to the woods now this gives us a nice kind of segue through we're not talking about british at all we're going to be delving further south long way south a long way south. More rich as home territory. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're going right down into Australia. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so mm. he's got his wobble board and his did we do out. I did do. Yeah, yeah wobble board, yeah. <laughs> now Paul actually wanted to talk about this. Right? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we we've done hundreds and thousands of shows about the paranormal mm -hmm. and we've talked about Bigfoot and the abominable snowman and the yeti and all that but one we haven't actually talked about is the australian yowie mm. so i thought you know what we should slap that down on the table as a subject for tonight quite a tricky one really because what you're looking at is a completely different belief system to what anything that we are open to mm -hmm. absolutely and that, that you know that is again why i thought we should look at it because 
you know, Bigfoot in the, in the US is a big thing at the moment. And the Yowie is the Australian version of that. And as you said, it's got a different belief system to it entirely. Mm-hmm. So although it's categorised as a type of Bigfoot, mm-hmm. we'll look at the truth. Mm. Mm. Well, well, I say truth, legends and yeah, the... from the Aboriginals. But we do have to look at it as a from different angles. We this is the problem mm. with cryptozoology. It's like there is no physical evidence of this. I will say that, although there are people that would argue that point, controversial, but there is no actual verified scientific verifiable evidence of a of a. I want to say bricks and mortar kind no, of thing. Okay. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's or, not like a flesh. Of a biological, yeah. yeah of I a... think it's more so circumstantial, isn't it? Circumstantial evidence as opposed to, yeah. um, you know, scientific evidence. Mm-hmm. Um, like, for example, the ones in, the Ameri- in America where they find nests, or what mm-hmm. they claim is a nest of a Bigfoot, that they don't know Bigfoot exists, so they would just presume that they'd bed down in these nests Mm. Um, so again, you know that that's circumstantial. Mm. It's a circumstance that fits, like the footprints and yeah. you know stuff like that. So it's important to have a look at the whole spectrum surrounding it as to why possibly these crypto type creatures sort of like come up. Now with <laughs> the Aboriginals, they believe in something called the Dream Time. Okay, now this is their spiritual belief and is a verbal passed on verbally throughout Mm -hmm. their tales and their culture and their artistic creation i'll go with because it's like you know um because they have no written language the aboriginals no it's all yeah no and they are oral Mm -hmm. they are a very spiritual race aren't they incredibly they're incredibly linked to their land and their environment which when you look at the australia when you look at the australia when you look at australia even you've got to look at the environment that they're living in it's incredibly difficult it's incredibly harsh Mm. and dangerous Mm. i I think you know this is all again you know what people have um put on to the aborigines because I, i i actually believe that you know, when they do this walkabout for 40 days and, mm-hmm. you know, come back and they've gone on a spiritual journey. I don't believe that whatsoever. What I think it is, is that his missus indoors has just done his head in <laughs> and he's like, you know what? I'm going on a walkabout. <laughs> what off Would it surprise me. Before, you know. <laughs> Would not surprise me. And then he comes back and goes, oh, I found God. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I think we need to have a look at the Aboriginal belief system um to kind of get an understanding of where this possibly where the roots of this might lie now basically the dream time is ancestral and we're talking ancestral like from the beginning it's like the birth of creation it's the creation story mm-hmm. aboriginal styley as mm-hmm. it were yeah so yeah. it's the land and the people were created by spirits yeah and they made the rivers, the streams, the water holes, the land, the hill, the rocks, the plants, the animals. I mean, God, some of the animals, what were they thinking? But basically, these spirits gave the tribes, the totems, the way forward, all of those things so they can survive in this landscape and make sense of the environment surrounding them. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's a very good idea as well because, you know, we all dream i mean okay i don't ever remember my dreams but i'm sure i dream um and it's just their way of making sense of it isn't it that that's what it is and to put a spiritual spin on it as you said you know some of the animals i think it's just god having a laugh by the time he got to australia he was knackered and he's like you know what i have this otter thing um i don't know how to finish it off we'll put a duck bill on it (laughs) I don't know. Some of the way he thinks, Richard, it's mm, like... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> a little worrying. It's just a mishmash, isn't it? You know. I love the way you put a Christian belief system, which is generally Western, onto Aboriginals <laughs> who'd believe something completely different. Well, it's, yeah, but they still must believe in a god of sorts. They believe in the ancestors. 
Well, there's their gods multiple there. rather than multiple, yeah. a single omnipresent well, god. The Romans had multiple, but they were still gods. Mm. But and, yeah, it's still a godlike presence, whatever they want to call it. It's the difference, the the I day. think, the difference is between the Western side of a pantheon of gods. Oh, I need to get that word out. And the Aboriginals is the Aboriginals is very, very linked into their environment. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? It's it's a lot more environmentally linked. Well, yeah, the land itself, you exactly. know, is, is well, that's is, it. They live off the land as well, so mm-hmm. the yeah, land provides for them. And the land itself is sacred. Exactly. Yeah. Believe you me, I mean, uh, if a Western person was dropped in the middle of the outback, you, you wouldn't survive for too long. Not a chance. <laughs> but so but the Aboriginals... Crocodile Dundee does well. Pardon? Crocodile Dundee. Right. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> he wow. was made by the Aboriginals, though, wasn't he? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of your silly humour. <laughs> That's a Lincoln good film. <laughs> As Richard said, the ancestors were the ones that showed the people, the Aboriginal people, the places that were to be sacred. Mm -hmm. Now, the Aboriginals then performed ritual ceremonies and songs near these sites to keep the ancestral spirits happy and also allowed them to stay alive in this harsh environment. Yeah. Yeah. There are lots of different, I would say there's about 400 different types of Aboriginal tribes in Australia. They all have their own dialect, they all have their own story, but there are fundamental comparisons between all of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's, it's like the UK, you know, the indigenous population all have different accents. Yes, but even the tales within those tribes are slightly different, but they all come down to the same sort of meaning and fundamental understanding of their environment. Now, like those in the Northern Territory believed that the ancestors were snakes, going back to the snake show, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, But in other places, they think that they were spirit. They call them spirits. So there's a fundamental difference in understanding of what was the ancestral creation of what that spirit form took but ultimately when you boil it down to the message it's very similar yeah okay now the dream time it dates back like sixty five thousand years that's a long time isn't it it's a long time ago yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and again it's the understanding of the creation of how human beings were created how they were intended to function within their world Mm. and make sense of their environment. But they Mm. also believe that the beginning, it's a beginning that never ended. Mm. So there is, it's all together, it's past, present and future all together. Yeah. Mm. Oh, goodness The never ending story for you. Still cannot say it. Yeah. Yeah, Still, even after like, what was it? A couple of weeks ago now, wasn't it? (laughs) <laughs> but they learned about their beginnings. This is where their belief system is rooted, is in their beginnings and the actions of the creators as to why they're there, what journey they're going through, their life lessons and their progression through this past, present and future. So it's mm-hmm. all tied together. That interconnectedness is so incredibly important to the Aborigines. Yeah. Okay. Now, they believed that the land was occupied but not like it is today. So it was like kind of, it was empty, but then placed, things were placed because of the ancestors. And because the ancestors had placed them there, the the rocks and the, you know, rivers and the bordering holes and the fauna and all of that, because the ancestors had deliberately placed things where they placed them, that they would never doubt it. Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. Everything was formed by these ancestors. Now, when we talk ancestors, we're not talking human ancestors. We're talking spiritual, spirit ancestors. Yeah. So, if you wanted to equate it, it would be like saying God created the world in seven days 
on day one he said let there be light and there was light you know it's it's equivalent to that but yeah there's ancestors mm. that have created things and put things deliberately where they put them this is why it's so incredibly sacred and certain sites i mean god there's even today there are court cases from the aborigines saying because we have expanded into their territories and desecrated really sacred sites for the aborigines yeah. it's such a pollution of their belief system and it's very similar to what we see with the native americans in america yeah 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 there is a similarity yeah mm -hmm. there are definite similarities and i i don't like it actually i don't think you should you should be respectful of another's belief system but this has been going on for decades you know like centuries mm -hmm. um, years. well since we the western people decided to go and take land from people other people basically yeah it's mm -hmm. us that have done this not you know the europeans have done this to both cultures mm -hmm. and it's not right but anyway that started hundreds of years ago and it's a mess that it, i don't think will ever get resolved now no. so the creators or the ancestors made men women and animals and they declared the laws of the land and how the people were supposed to behave to one another so this this incorporates customs and food supply and distribution initiation rituals ceremonies death ceremonies birth ceremonies you know all sorts of different things um are incorporated within this belief system written down by the ancestors mm -hmm. okay now they also talk of some mythical creatures that disappeared. Right. And they believe that the creators disappeared from the sight of mere, mortal, mere mortals, us guys, or them guys, should I say, not us, because we're not Aboriginals. Um, but they did continue to live in secret places. Secret places, sorry. Yeah. What noise is going on behind me? All oh, right. <laughs> it started already, is it? weird stuff's happening in my house tonight <laughs> so, yeah, we... and that's not with it not nothing to do with the children um now some lived in the rocky crevices trees water holes others went into the sky and became heavenly bodies others became natural forces such as like the wind the rain you know um the, the thunder the lightning that sort of thing what is going on you all right there dear honestly i've got some really strange sounds going on behind me oh, anyway right. Hmm. Oh, we'll see what happens later <laughs> if my yeah, tv yeah. goes on i will freak out big time yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's happened I'm before folks. in the kitchen then I? <laughs> yeah. it's believed that many of the creators continue to live on the land or in the sky above watching over them now these supernatural creators have the ability to change shape okay. yes so they're shapeshifters as well uh-huh or they become landmarks. Mm -hmm. We'll find out more about that in a bit. Okay? Okay. So the dream, the dreaming or the dream time exists. It continues to exist. It's surrounding them. It's it's in everything that they do, see, incorporate, what they see above them, what's going on below them. Every every part of this is still continuation. This this connectedness still going on within the dream dream time yeah the dreaming yeah people come and go but this state stays mm -hmm. okay so this is a deep understanding between the interaction of human and the environment now, the other thing that's really important to remember about this is they believe, and we've talked about this before as well, that sights hold feelings. It's a resonance. It's a vibration. So the sacred sights hold feeling. And do you remember we did a show on that, didn't we? Yeah. So sort of like, well, the most famous one in Australia would be Uluru, wouldn't it? Yeah. Or, or Ayers Rock, if you yeah. old like me. Mm. Exactly, exactly. And that is incredibly important because they 
linking to these feelings that resonate through these sites in a way that we don't really. Mm -hmm. We've cut that off. We've cut that off. Sorry, another sound behind me. <sighs> this is the reality of, of what these people are experiencing, the, the, the true Aboriginals. They're, nowadays, they have westernised to a certain degree and incorporated themselves in normal, you know, Western lifestyles. It's like I've got an animal behind me. You've yeah. probably summed up the dream time, haven't you? Talking about it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, folks. <laughs> anyway, so I wanted to have a look at one particular type of mythology regarding one of these creation stories, because I think when we go on to talk more about the Yowie, it brings a different understanding to what it could be. Mm -hmm. OK, it, when you have to take into account the belief systems that are going on as much as encounters that people have had. Yeah, because even when we've gone out on investigations or in places like the woods, there is a vibe. Yeah, well, Woodland, yeah, it's sort of like, you know, it's a very living sort of place, isn't it, Woodland? You know, you get all trees close together there and their roots uh, in must, must intertwine and it's like the whole place is alive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, to be fair, I mean, it is alive. Trees are alive. They're a living... Well, well they're living yeah. organisms, yeah. And I'm sure there's plenty of other organisms that are on the ground, even down to the quantum mechanics and mm. you know mm. one cell creatures and stuff, stuff stuff like that so the whole place is alive mm -hmm. the way you look at it and you know a lot of um people can sense that and i think that's where some of the folklore came in with the fairies and all that you know the elementals and things that look after that sort of environment yeah mm -hmm. it all ties in it does tie in, and, and the Aboriginals are incredibly tied into their environment. So let's have a look at the Rainbow, uh, the Rainbow Serpent. Now, this is one of the most famous of is the... He, is this Rainbow Serpent one of the LGBTQT crowd? I'm going to go with yes. Yes, uh, good answer. Yeah. <laughs> we, we like to be politically correct on this show. <laughs> <laughs> he throws me every time. Yeah. I start talking about something and he throws me. <laughs> right. Now, the Rainbow Serpent is actually a modern name. It's non-Aboriginal anthropologists put the title onto it. Yeah. Okay, so it's the Aboriginals don't call it the Rainbow Serpent, right? But the narrative is about a giant snake who is believed to be the source of all life. Now, this does depend on which indigenous group you're talking about in Australia. OK, so there are diff oh, many, many different names for this guy, um, for this snake, even this guy. Hey, this guy, yeah. um, this snake, right? And or whatever you want to identify as. Yeah. It's androgynous. It's not, it's not male or female. But all of the different stories and all of the the different versions all agree that he was the font of life, water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they sort of like uh, the Aboriginals look at rivers as uh, sort of the the serpent carved and carved out the rivers and water holes and it's stuff. Because because uh, I don't know, um, mm -hmm. is there a lot of water snakes in Australia? Not really, no. No, they, <laughs> no they're more Mississippi and America, yeah. aren't they? I, mean, I thought maybe that's maybe why they picked the snake to be water. That that was my thought process. Yeah. No, I, well, that, they've probably got a, a water snake. I mean, they've got sea snakes, I know that, but uh, water... Maybe yeah. that's where they got the idea from, and to associate with water because of that. Mm. Mm, I don't know, because the stories share a common thread, basically, a a huge snake sleeps beneath the surface of the earth before emerging from the ground and awakens different groups of animals. Mm -hmm. And it also forges features like the hills, gorges, the rivers and lakes. So he was the, the architect, if you like, of mm. the Australian outback. 
Okay. So this snake slithered all over the country and then went into the water holes to provide the water. And whilst he was on his way, he produced, shall we say, the geographical features while he was doing it. I bet he was absolutely knackered by the time he'd finished. And I really bet he got a big surprise at Alice Springs. <laughs> okay. Now, the serpent and the rainbow are linked because obviously the rainbow is, um, they see that, the rainbow as a sign of the rainbow snake. Yeah. That's why it's got its name, rainbow serpent. Right, now, scientists actually found some rock paintings and in Arnhem Lane. Arnhem Lane, yes. In the Northern Territory. Yeah, that Arnhem features Lane. the ancestor spirit. Now, that dates back as far as 8,000 years mm-hmm okay all right so he incorporates he's quite a very influential figure in regards to um the physical because you can see the watering holes and you can it's the life giver of water but you saw he's also like made the landscape what it is yeah so it's life giving but it can be destructive as well yeah. because obviously you've got floods and yeah. you know tornadoes and whatever else they have um out there now they believe that the serpent goes from one watering hole to the next replenishing the water holes around the country so that's what explains the source of water never drying up in some of the water holes mm -hmm. in drought season okay and he is particularly connected to ceremonies and rituals regarding fertility Right. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, a lady or a girl coming of age into her cycle, <laughs> cringe, um, <laughs> is very sacred to the Aboriginals because it is the re reproductive power, the, it is the fertility, it is the regeneration that that symbolises. And that is very indicative of the serpent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, sometimes the rainbow serpent is shown as a virgin, uh, sorry, as a vagina, even. <laughs> 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 symbolised as a vagina in paintings because of that new life symbol symbolism. Right. Okay. okay. Goodness. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Right. Um, it is one of the oldest belief systems in the world. Okay. And is still influential today across the world, actually, because believe it or not, not just Australia, but everybody kind of knows about the rainbow snake. Yeah, or, or the serpent in mm -hmm. general, yeah. Yeah. In, in South America, they have the feathered serpent. Mm -hmm. you know. See how so. it all ties together, boys? We never thought mm -hmm. we'd talk about snakes on a show about the Yowie, right? No, absolutely. Mm, it's very interesting, but it, it shows he ends he ends up being part of the Milky Way as well, mm -hmm. above in the sky above that he's he's part of that as well. So again, it's above, beyond, and below. It's it, he's part of everything. Yeah, because the Milky Way is often looked upon as a, a celestial river, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Exactly, all indicative of this rainbow serpent that we've talked about. Still getting noises. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's not raining or anything. There's hardly any wind tonight. It's, oh, it's very still, isn't it? It's very, very still. Okay. So, just looking at that one myth, that one icon, 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 iconic uh, um, myth that is part of their belief system and how they incorporate it into their understanding of their environment surrounding them and the use of that within their culture mm -hmm. i then want to bring you onto the hours so i want you to keep that in mind yeah yeah of their belief system and now we're going to talk about the yowie because the yowie has several names okay hmm here we go, folks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not just Brian, Sarah, no. Fred. It weren't just them names, was it? 
unfortunately not. No, we have got some lovely names to try and pronounce tonight, boys. So. I, th- I think maybe as as Richard was like Australian for a little while. Think, <laughs> uh, don't, yeah. Don't get me to attempt you, these. You know some of these names. <laughs> no, I don't. I just know it's the Yowie. Okay. Or the Yahoo I've heard before as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, ha! Huh. Queensland, they can be known as the Queenkin or the Jugabina. <laughs> In yeah. Use- mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah? Yeah, I'll go with those. Okay, thank you. New South Wales, they could be called the Jirawara. Mm-hmm. You mean the Mingawin? The Mingawin? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Putty can, Gubba, Gubba, Dulaga, Dulaga, yeah, Gulaga, yeah, Thulaga, right, yeah. Mm hmm. Other names could be the Yahoo, the Aroma, the Nukuna, the Wawi, the Pankalangu, the Jimbra. Oh, I had a little. In my voice there, the Jangara. Oh, goodness me! Ha! Huh. Now, uh, many people discount the existence of these. We're going to just call them the Yowies, right? Yeah. Um, the existence yeah. of these Yowies. A lot of people think it's misidentification, folklore, hoax. Do you know what I mean? It's exactly the same as the Sasquatch mm. in um, North America as it is in Australia. In regards to Mm -hmm. this creature, yeah? Yeah. The difference is the Aboriginals, I'll say the difference. I don't believe the Sasquatch has got links to the Native Americans in the same way the Yowie has to the Australians. Oh, right. I could be wrong on that from my understanding of Sasquatch, but I feel the Yowie has a lot more of a connection to their belief system in regard to the Aboriginal belief system than, as I say, the Sasquatch has to the Native Americans. The reason being is there is sort of like a... There's a lot of creatures, mythological creatures. There's one called the Bunyap or Bunyip. Bunyip. Um, Yeah, that people have sort of like said that this was what people saw but this is total mythical creature, right? Now, so I wanted to have a little look at the Bunyip um, to sort of kind of give you an understanding of the difference between the mythological creatures and an experience that somebody's had, if that makes sense. There is nobody that's come forward and says they've had an experience with a Bunyip. Nah. This is This tends to be one of those urban folklore legends mm. and is used to... Um, stop children being tardy or um stop tourists from doing stuff you know what i mean mm-hmm. because it's one of those now <coughs> this is uh, the bunyip is said to inhabit the reedy swamps and lagoons of the interior of australia it's an amphibious creature it's supposed to have a round head and the elongated neck and a body that resembles uh, like a ox or a hippopotamus or a manatee type creature Mm -hmm. okay but some accounts have given it a human figure now it's supposed to make like roaring noises or booming noises and devours human prey loves a bit of women and children yeah particularly women and children by the sounds of it yeah Mm -hmm. now this could be a man thing which they said right you know if you tardy on your tusks through this area, you could get eaten by a bunyip. So don't rest, basically. Get on with the job in hand. Possibly. I don't know. But some have said that this is similar to um, a seal. Fugitive seals, they call them, um, that swim inland, basically. Yeah. Personally, yeah, I don't think so. But, you know. And they also say that the cry could be the bitten marsh bird. All said yeah. to like basically scare you from from loitering. Um, do you know what I mean? In the thing now, there is a the the tail of the bunyip is pretty gross. Um, 
he's supposed to like eat you, throw you up, and then eat you again. I believe. Oh, right. Sorry, my net bite is itching, so I'm just having a <laughs> Yeah, right. I've got a little scratch there. The difference between the Bunyip and the Yowie is it's a completely different creature. Well, yeah. I mean, the Bunyip is uh, it's a waterborne creature, isn't it? It is. It's like, when I've described that, that is completely different from the characteristics of the Yowie. Mm-hmm. Right? So, although, like, some people have said, oh, you know, it's they're interchangeable but i don't think that they are when i looked at it they they seem two totally different completely different to me totally different complete different belief systems in regards to that's one thing but this is something different because the yaoi is described as a hairy and ape-like creature that stands upright yeah really tall six foot eleven to twelve foot i mean that's really tall right um feet are big massive feet and yaoi tracks are inconsistent in shape and tone number, which is really weird. Mm-hmm. Okay, now they say that they vary more than what you see in regards to the Sasquatch. Yeah. So they're, although there are comparisons with the Sasquatch, it does seem to be a completely different creature as well. It's 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 similar in regards to it gets labelled under the Sasquatch Yeti kind of thing, but when you sort of break it down into what they found or what they think it looks like and descriptions, similarities but not the same. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but could it be like the old is it Red Panda? I think isn't it that isn't that a relative of bear or something? But in Years ago, they used to think that it was a relative of the panda because it looks like a panda, mm. but red, obviously. But maybe, it's actually a bear. Yeah, maybe that's some. Um, maybe that's why. I, I don't know, but the, although they're say the comparisons, they are very different. And there's a difference. Like some people say they're timid and shy, and others say that they are violent and aggressive. Although I didn't really find any cases where they were aggressive not really you could put it down to other things like dingoes or you know it it was a bit like that mm-hmm. now the origin of the name yaoi they think was first used in 1875 among the Kalamin people I don't know what that word is. Mm. It's got accents above the A and the O, and I don't know how that changes it. Yeah. But Reverend William Ridley, who who first documented it, says it was a spirit that roams over the earth at night. That's why I found it interesting, because it linked in with almost like that mythological belief system regarding to the dream time. Mm. Yeah, or it could just be nocturnal. It's because he called him a spirit. Mm. But he has been seen during the day. Oh, yeah. Modern writers think it came through the legends of the Yahoo. Which is basically an interchangeable name for the Yahoo. Yeah. Right, they yeah. just changed the name a little bit. Now, Robert Holden recount several stories that support this from the 19th century. Now, this is a European account from 1842. The natives of Australia believe in the Yahoo, hashtag Yowie, um, resembles a man nearly the same height with long white hair hanging down from the head over the features. The arms are extraordinarily long, finished at the extremities with great talons and feet turned backwards so that on flying from man, the imprint of the foot appears as if it has been travelling in the opposite direction. He de- they described as a hideous monster of unearthly character and ape-like appearance. Mm. So it's almost like the foot has got bits at the back to me that would look... Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, an extended heel or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
yeah something i have like heard that, that before the uh, you know in, and in some accounts you know the feet <laughs> appear to be reversed on the owies mm. mm -hmm. so and another story about the name was this is from an aboriginal source says that the creature is actually a part of the dream time now old bungaree who was an aboriginal said that there were tribes of them and they were original inhabitants of the country he said they were the old race of blacks and the blacks used to fight and the blacks used to beat them most of the time but the yahoo always made away from the blacks because they were faster runners yeah It's now, the same as in Native American law. There's a bit about that. Is uh, they did cohabitate, but uh, they would fight against each other, like humans against them. Mm -hmm. mm. Now the first documented Yowie sighting actually holds place in a place called Batesman Bay. Now. I ha I actually looked into this quite deeply. It's really, really interesting um, because we actually have newspaper articles backing this up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, hmm. This is when we get white men going to Australia. Yeah. Okay. So we're in 1882. Now, this was documented in the Australian Town and Country Journal. Yeah. Yeah. Now, naturalist Henry James McCuey wrote of his encounter with a strange creature in the bushland between Batesman Bay and Uladula. I really need an Australian accent, but I'm not even going to attempt mm -hmm. one because I'll sound like I'm Irish. You know, I mean, he writes, so I'm going to read what he said. A few days ago, I saw one of these strange creatures in an unfrequented locality on the coast between Batesman Bay and Uladula. My attention was attracted to it by the cries of a number of small birds which were pursuing and darting at it. When I first beheld the animal, it was standing on its hind legs, partly upright, looking up at the birds above it in the bushes, blinking its eyes and distorting its visage and making a low chattering kind of noise. Being above the animal on a slight elevation and distant from it, less than a chain, I had ample opportunity of noting its size and general appearance. I should think that if it was standing perfectly upright, it would be nearly five foot high, which to be fair, that's not that high compared no. to some of what other people have said. I mean, I'm five foot two. It's not as big as me. Mm -hmm. A juvenile, perhaps? Possibly. Yeah. It was tailless and covered with very long black hair, which was of a dirty red or snuff colour about the throat and breast. Its eyes, which were small and restless, were partly hidden by matted hair that covered its head. The length of the, of the forelegs or arms seemed to be strikingly out of proportion with the rest of its body. But in all other aspects, its build seemed to be fairly proportioned. It would weigh probably about eight stone. On the whole, it was a most uncouth and repulsive looking creature, evidently possessed of prodigious strength and one which I should not care to come to close quarters with. Having sufficiently satisfied my curiosity, I threw a stone at the animal, whereupon it immediately rushed off, followed by the birds, and disappeared in a ravine which was close at hand. What a sight! <laughs> now, when I read that, my first thought went orangutan. Yeah. yeah. Yeah? Yeah, no, I don't do that. As far as I'm aware, there aren't any orangutans in Australia. No, but they are a little bit further up north in uh, oh, where, oh, where, where, Java, isn't it? Java, your, yeah. Yeah, they, they're sort of that side of the world, but not down in Australia. But, yeah, it does but sound that's like what it sounded brand. like to me. Yeah. yeah. It sounded like that to me. Who knows, maybe there was, I don't know, a, an odd orangutan. Yeah. Don't ask me how it got to Australia, I don't know, but, you know, who knows? But that's what it sounded like to me. Mm. Now, Miff Thompson, who's the curator at the Old Courthouse Museum in Bateson Bay, says 
that it's a piece of the town's history. She didn't know about it until they started to look it up and they found these newspaper articles. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we've got this a standoff between McCoy, who wrote the article, and the curator of the Australian Museum in Sydney at the time, Mr Edward Pearson Ramsey. Now, Mr. Ramsey questioned the existence of such a creature. Um, basically, it was described as an Australian ape. Now, McCoy says his claims were poo-pooed by academics like Ramsey because he was an amateur, because he was only a naturalist. He was, you know, he doesn't yeah. have brand, brand new country, right? Yeah. Um, and we've got a back and forth between the two people. We've got somebody who's like the curator of a museum in Sydney going, he's talking crap, everybody. But the guy said, that's what I saw. I'm only documenting what I saw. That's it, right? Now, you can't rush to the conclusion that there was none in the colony. It's improbable to think an ape would present itself forward mm. in that way. They're quite a solitary, lonely. If it was an orangutan type ape, Mm, you no, not likely to see one, right? Mm, no. And they never caught one. There's no scientific evidence, or there wasn't any scientific evidence at that time, that there was an ape. Yeah. Yeah, you get lemurs yeah. and stuff like that, but not an orangutan type ape, which is what this is suggestive of. Mm. Now, McCooey says, I do not claim to be the first to have seen this animal, for I can put my finger on half a dozen men at Batesman Bay who have seen the same, or at any rate, an animal of a similar description. But I think I am the first to come forward in the columns of a newspaper and give publicity to the fact of actually seeing it. Mm. He put... I may mention that a search party was organised at Batesman Bay some months ago to surround the locality and the supposed ape to shoot or capture it. The idea was abandoned in consequence of the likelihood of gun accidents. Mm, trigger happy. Yeah. <laughs> and I may further state that the skeleton of an ape, four foot in length, may be seen at any time in a cave 14 miles from Batemans Bay in the direction of Ulladula. All right. Now, Ramsey did then turn around and say, well, I'll offer £100 to bring in this Yowie dead or alive. And McCooey believed it was a challenge he could meet. But so far as we can tell, the £100 was not claimed. No, I'd want more than that. Back then, though, in eighteen in the 1800s. Yeah. A lot of money. A lot of money. Well, yeah, yeah, back then, yeah. 11 months later, this is still going on between the two men, between Ramsey and McCooey. Now, McCooey was writing from Man Durama um, in 1883. He said, the position taken by the curator of the museum is absolutely untenable. There are indigenous apes in this colony. They have been frequently seen in the Budawong Mountains, in the Jingera Mountains, and in the Abercrombie Mountains at Batesman Bay, at Mount MacDonald, and on the Guy Fawkes Road between Armadale and Grafton. Apes were known to the Aboriginals of this colony and were dreaded by them. Long before a museum was founded in Australia or a white man crossed the Murray and that one was actually captured and killed near Braidwood within the memory of persons still living. Mm. However, modern time looking at it, fells that Ramsey questioned McCoy's motivations, said he was more interested in claiming the money, he was an amateur naturalist, who suggested the cash reward, not him. Um, uh, it, it's, it's one of those, he said, she says. Yeah, so this and is it's where so it all back gets a bit confusing, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. It becomes, you know, one of those. But was it an ape? Did they have apes back then? Did Is that what he saw, was just an ape? Or was it a yaoi? Ramsey suggested the Australian landscape couldn't sustain a creature such as McCoy's. Yeah. That's why they've never been found found again. Mm, who knows, right? Yeah. So I thought about this. 
and I thought about this quite a lot. Looking at the dream time belief system of your Aborigines, you've got the arrivance of new settlers. So you've got the Aborigines clashing with new settlers back in the time. Although in the 1800s it was a lot more established, you still have, it takes a long time for cultures to integrate into understanding of each other and integrate is the right word. Mm. So you've got a clash of belief systems that will start to evolve and change within the accumulation between two cultures. So by the 1800s, you've got an evolvement rather than a complete integration. Mm. Could the Yahweh be a representation of that belief system that the Aborigines were experiencing, disconnectedness? When you think about the dream time, you know, the interconnectedness of the ancestors. So ancestors would represent past, then Aboriginals in the present, and almost like the white man coming forward in the future, like that's a completely new experience to them and new way of living. Mm. Does that make sense? So yeah. I was wondering if the Yowie was like a physical representation in a spiritual way of that integration and that interconnectedness between the belief systems. Discuss. Well, it's probably within the Aboriginal communities, yes, but uh, when you're getting the sort of, you know, the first sort of white settlers going over and actually sort of, you know, claiming to see something that represents an ape, you know, because uh, I should imagine back then most people would have, most Europeans going over would have been quite ignorant of the Aboriginal belief systems and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I mean... I mean, they may have even found cave drawings of them. Mm. Mm. It's a difficult one, isn't it, to, to understand a time period that's incredibly new. Yeah, yeah. Coming into a very ancient belief system in regards yeah. to, the, you know, what that first encounter with the white and then them settling and then them like, you know what I mean? It, it does draw into that kind of thing. You know, you mm. are going to be defensive regarding your environment. Of course you are. It's your environment and someone's come along and gone up oh, think I'll plot a score here. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Um, and disrupt their ancient belief systems with their own belief yeah. systems coming forward. You know, you've got Catholicism and Christianity coming through, which is a totally different ball game, totally different to what you believe in regards to your environment and your culture. And when you get something like a mythical creature coming forward at this time, who is very representative of a humanoid, you you know, an ape, whether it's an ape or whether it was a representation, it's ancestral in its facade. Do you know what I mean? It's ancestral mm. in its um, appearance. Yeah. From, you know, when we think about our ancestors, you go like Nathanderal. They're very similar, less hairy, but very similar in appearance to what you would expect, but they're bigger. Yeah. I will say that. You know, I... I I just found that quite interesting, which is why I found it really necessary to address the dream time and yeah. that belief system in it. I actually come to the end of the first half. All right. So hold that thought, Richard. Will do. We'll be back right after this. Hello, Harry Price here. If there's nothing me and my friends enjoy more here on the other side, it is to sit back and relax and listen to the Paranormal Concept Show right here on the PAUK Radio Network. Broadcasting a plethora of interesting and informative content for all your paranormal needs. Find them across social media to keep up to date with forthcoming shows and all their other adventures. 
Hello, is there anybody there? Welcome back to the Paranormal Concept Show, exclusive to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Oh my goodness, we've had a week off, boys, and I, I'm all over the show. What am yeah. I doing? What am I doing? I don't well, put know. Put yourself together, woman. So what was your thought before we went to the break, Richard? Yeah, I sort of... Um, I want to believe the Yowie exists, the same with, with Bigfoot and um, sort of like the Yeti and stuff. I've, I've always been drawn to it and sort of deep down, I do believe that these creatures possibly exist. Mm. through the testimony of witnesses and if I says oh yeah but it's a person then in a gorilla suit and stuff I mean I mean come on I mean there's you know there's only so much you can do uh hoaxing I mean if people uh, have people really got anything better to do and go around hoaxing or planting footprints in the middle of nowhere well, there was uh, a bloke who put on a dinosaur footprint and walked along the beaches in South Sussex. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, that's but that's just one. Yeah, you know. so I've watched these um, documentaries on telly because that, that's the only way I'm going to get to see these sort of evidence, um, unless by some miracle I actually go to one of the museums over there um, where I can see the evidence for myself, um, and it is quite compelling. But sometimes you sit there and go, really? You know, some of it is quite far-fetched. And they're talking about behavioural patterns of a creature that they don't know exists. Mm. So how can they come out with the behavioural patterns? Like, for example, when they're knocking knocking on the wood, you know, who's to say that there's not another Bigfoot hunter like five miles away replying to your wood knocks? And, and things like that. It's It's just so... It's interesting, but there still could be a logical explanation for it. The one that baffles me, and I know Kerry will probably go, no, it's something else, but it was that one on Expedition Bigfoot where they caught what appeared to be a shadow yeah, of on what that looked like face, Gimlin yeah. um, Bigfoot mm. walking, and then all of a sudden it dis- dissipated. To cause a shadow, there has to be an object in between the light source and where it's displayed. I think you have to be really careful, though, when you're looking at certain footage. Yeah, it's just it's just one that I can't personally explain. You know, it's like pareidolia. The footage was crap. Nighttime footage is never great. Yeah, no, I'll give you that. So you can't uh, say it had a shadow because that could be uh, it was just so grainy. It just isn't enough. It's, I don't, that's no, the I problem know, I have know. with a lot of this. But as I said, you know, I, it's something that I saw and I can't explain. Yeah, I mean, I saw it that. It did look as well. like what, it was a, what they claimed it was. Yeah. Right. If you put a forensic pathologist in there, right, and a human had walked across there, they would have found something that you could, that's tangible, that it was human. No, that's right. But what we're saying is, but they're not to doing cast that a shadow things. like what they found on on that footage. What looked like a shadow. Okay, what looked like a shadow? Whatever it was, it was a shadow. It kind of makes me feel like it's a bit like, did you hear that? Play it back. This is what you should have heard. No, no. When you I'd look at it on the telly, I've seen it before they put it put it on, mm. and said this is what it is. Um, but it, it was definitely a shadow of something. I'm not saying it's Bigfoot because there's no actual evidence of anything being between the light source and the shadow where you would expect something to be to cast that shadow. Their theory, and I think it's very far-fetched, is that the Bigfoot can cloak. Okay. You know, I, I do get the idea of things cloak in because obviously I'm a big Star Trek fan and they use cloak ships all the time so I can understand the, their science of bending light I get that but then if if for argument's sake the Bigfoot could bend light then it wouldn't cast a shadow because the light mm-hmm. still go around mm-hmm. 
But I, I just don't believe that an animal can mm. do that. But then I go back to what we witnessed. Well, I say witnessed. We didn't witness it. We watched the missing 411 and there was that lady who was a hunter yeah. that was in a tree and she said that there was something and it looked like the predator when he was cloaked and the camera that she was holding you know it was weird yeah absolutely and there was like a ufo sighting a bit before that wasn't there across the town over yeah. a football match or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is another theory we've heard as well in regard to these type of creatures yeah but we are looking more like sasquatch on this these type you, you're going off your sasquatch not your yowie and although they're very similar they've not had those kind of encounters in regards to the yowie mm. does that make sense Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. You know yeah, I mean? I mean the Yowie is more elusive than the North American Bigfoot, uh, but you can put that down to population density and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. there's less people in Australia for a start. I mean, there's only what twenty million people that actually live in Australia. I mean, compared to the United States, which has over. Oh, Three hundred million, is it or something? Yeah, you know, yeah, it's you know it's, it's, it, it, it is a lot different, you know. But I think if, but when you sort of look at it side by side with with population densities and stuff, it does level up. And even though there's less in Australia, the population, you know, uh, the it maths can see more on the outskirts, doesn't it? Yeah, on the along, coastline. Yeah, along the east coast of Australia. Yeah. What's so. really interesting, though, I will put this into the mix. When I was looking at um, density of sightings, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if this puts a different spin on things. I've got it written down here. Fifty-one percent of Yowie sightings were seen in Queensland. Mhm. Mm Forty-one percent were seen in New South Wales. Yeah. Six point five percent was seen in Victoria. And the rest, the 1.5% was actually seen in the rest of Australia. So they do yeah. seem to be on the side where... Where, you know, of along that sort of, the whole of the East Coast, sort of Queensland down into New, uh, New South Wales. I mean, you get back from the coast and into the hinterland. I mean, it's all forested area. Mm -hmm. I mean, and again, like the American uh, Northwest, is it... Uh, it's uh you know it's fast mm. yeah absolutely fast yeah at this point i want to bring another cryptic creature into the room now this is called the outback vampire is the yeah. yaramara yaha oh good old yaramara yaha you can bring as many cryptids into the studio as you like as long as you're clearing up after them yeah of course now, this is restricted to the forests of the Pacific Coast. Um, and then everywhere else, this is just purely on the Pacific Coast side of things. These are a little bit like the bunyan that we talked about earlier. Oh, the bunyip. Yeah, the bunyip. Thank you, Richard, because you know me. I get these names don't <laughs> stick in my head at all in any way, shape or form. Um, now, he is four feet tall, red, covered with fur. Um, he has a disproportionately larger head. He's got a toothless mouth like a snake, and his belly and his throat is distendable. He can easily swallow an adult man without discomfort, and his fingers and toes are equipped with suction cups. They're good Ooh. climbers, and they can only waddle on the land like a cockatoo. That sucks. <laughs> they like thick leaved fig trees and they wait for days in the branches until a little traveller seeks shelter or rest beneath said tree and then it attaches its hands and feet on the victim's bodies it uses the suction cups to drain them of blood doesn't leave them empty entirely only enough to make them faint how convenient and then he goes back you know after a while yeah, and well, was... swallows them whole I was reading this earlier, yeah, sort of like, you know, and it's the way he keeps going back, swallows them and regurgitates and then swallows them again, doesn't he? Beautiful. Lovely. Lovely. 
I love the way he does a little dance to let the food go down as well. A little dance. <laughs> he then vomits his prey out, as Richard says. Uh, the human is still almost always alive. Um, <laughs> clearly not able to fight back at this stage, I would say. And then basically he does it again. He pokes it with sticks. Walks away, tickles them. No, he's playing dead. This human that he's just thrown back up again. It's not, it's not acting very lively. Um, and then basically goes to sleep, keeps going on this, and then eventually eats him. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's disgusting. <laughs> basically, he keeps eating you, regurgitating you, eating, regurgitating you, basically, and in the end, you become a Yarama Yaha yourself. Yeah. Well, I thought fun. I'd bring that one to the table. <laughs> yeah. Love it. But again, that's more of an urban legend folklore. And I think that, you know, there is a difference, and I, that's why I'm bringing the mythological into it, because the difference is... Between the Dreamtime mythological creatures like the Yara Mayaha and the Bunyip, yeah, they're very, very different to what we're getting in regards to the accounts of the Yahweh. Yeah. Yeah, because you look at the account you just read of the uh, vampire tree sucking thing or, or whatever it is. And uh, I mean, that is just, you know, you read it, you look at it, and it is ridiculous, isn't it? Totally. And the same with the bunyip, you know, is sort of it. It has all these fanciful things and connected with it. But whereas mm. the yaoi, it's sort of people just sort of relaying experiences, uh, sort of like a sighting of it. As opposed exactly. Yeah. You know, People just see them. I mean, they don't really know that much about them, but, you know, they just have encounters with them. But this is kind of why I felt it really important to look at some of the other kind of creatures yeah. that are part of the dream time and mm. how their belief system regarding these creatures and, and their mythological of their creation story was so important. Because one of the earliest and most controversial of the Aoi sightings happened in 1936 by a guy called Rich Jones. He was a logger working in New South Wales. Now, going back to what we said about sightings, 41% of sightings yeah. occur mm. in New South Wales. Now, he took several photographs of what appeared to be a large, dark creature sitting on a log with his hands folded. It's a very famous photograph. Um, as I say, it's controversial. A lot of people think that it's matrixing. Ma matrixing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, when I looked at it, because that's the photo you sent us earlier, wasn't it? Yeah, which we're going to share to the Paranormal Concept Facebook group page. So go over there, join that if you're interested. Yeah. Um, I actually thought that it was pixelation. Um, and there is a video. Isn't there a video that goes with it? No, 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 no. This is just 19. The 1936 is just the photo. Oh, yeah. right. Now, a lot of people think it's it. Now, Jones himself says it's legitimate. Yeah, what you mm -hmm. see is what I took, right? But we all know about matrixing, otherwise known as pareidolia, apophenia, or anthro anthropomorphizing. Anthropomorphizing. Which is basically your brain's telling you what your eyes are seeing. Yeah, so your brain is making up a sense of your environment around you so you see things where there aren't things. Now, remember, our brain is programmed to recognise faces and humanoid shapes because that is our first recognition. When we open our eyes as a baby, we see our mum... And we recognise faces. It is a hardwire thing. That is why we do these things, which is why pareidolia is so important to remember and recognise within the paranormal field or the cryptological world or whatever world you're looking at. Mm. And this is what people say this photograph is. We will share the photograph to the Paranormal Concept group page on Facebook um, and maybe Twitter and maybe Instagram if we remember. <laughs> So you can have a look for yourselves. It is quite compelling. 
I can understand why people say it is what it is. I can't see a Yowie sitting there like the blokes, though, and them not noticing it in real life. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's, that's one That's kind thing, of yeah. a big one. I'll just sit here and <laughs> photobomb. That's what she said. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, I, um, I don't know about that one. But there is an account that has significant support. And this happened in 1977. Now, in 1977, there was a period of five months and there were five separate Yowie incidences reported in the same area. Right. One of the people that reported an experience was a senator, Bill O'Chi. Now, this is a guy who's an international standard athlete. He's a bachelor, or was at the time anyway. <laughs> um, and he was he had quite a reputation. Oh, yeah. Okay. He's had quite a illustrious career, should we say. And he had this particular incident. Now, I want to talk about one of the incidences that happened. The, the, so there are five different instances that happened all within five months. Yeah. Okay. It started with um, a ranger, not Ochi, but this is the first one. It started with a National Parks Wildlife Ranger. He had an encounter. He was clearing a trail near the best of all lookout. He thought it was a wild pig, so he stepped into the scrub and he came face to face with this big, black, hairy man thing, more like a gorilla than anything else. Now, this is 1977. We now know what orangutans are, what chimpanzees are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we know what a gorilla is. We know apes. Yeah. Okay. Now, he said he was in, within four metres of this creature, close enough to see the hair on the back of one of its huge human-like hands that was wrapped around a sapling. The, ra the ranger was 1.8 metres, estimated the creature to be about 2.5 metres tall. Mm -hmm. It had a flat, black, shiny face, two big yellow eyes and a hole for a mouth. And it was a bit like he stared at it, it stared at him. And it was a bit like, what the heck? They were both like frozen by each other. You know, it's like, oh, my it's, God, stand yeah. Yeah, yeah, both both startled, are you? Yeah. Yeah, that moment where you're like, oh, you know. He said he was so numb he couldn't even raise his axe because obviously he's clearing a trail, so he's got an axe, right? Yeah. Um, And obviously it's hot. He said he felt paralysed with shock. And he said it, he reckoned it was about 10 minutes. He, they stood there staring at each other for. And he said that it gave off a really bad smell. Okay. That made him feel really sick. Mm -hmm. And then the creature sort of like shuffled off sideways and then just disappeared. See, that's another sort of thing they share in common with uh, Sasquatch because uh, a lot of reports say that they smell as well. A real, mm -hmm. a real putrid but type I, I smell. I want to know what that witness did after seeing it because if he didn't change his trousers <laughs> oh my god you can't believe what i've just saw <laughs> did you see that kind of moment right but less than three kilometers away from that ranger's encounter yeah mm -hmm. below chi he was 13 at the time bearing in mind but he went on to have this illustrious career. So he's not going to talk about something that happened when he was 13 that could damage his career. But he obviously had this encounter. Now, the campground was the Kunjawa campground. It was new. It was on open, gra open grazing land right on the edge of this dense forest. The boys, two teachers, were in cabins. And it was from the window of one of those at midday that the first sighting occurred. Bill saw it. The creature was uphill in an open, treeless area. First of all, it was lying on the ground. It stood up, moved slowly, mm -hmm. but it was close enough to be seen with the naked eye. And it remained out in the open long enough for each boy to observe it carefully through binoculars. Yeah. Is this the senator? This is the senator guy who went on to be a senator. Yeah. He was 13 at the time. Okay. Okay. 
It was a bright sunny day. The creature stood out in clear detail. And he says there was no doubt about it. In the morning, they found large indistinct footprints and several metre high bushes that had been ripped right out of the rock hard ground and held all over the place. Mm. Yeah, it's certainly. So I've heard that one before. It's quite a famous out, account. Did this come out before he was a senator or after? No, it was reported. What happened afterwards was they were told not to say anything about the incident. Right. Okay, because the school wanted to utilise the campsite for the school trips and they didn't want to scare people. Yeah. Okay, so the school paper that wrote about the account Never was mind. actually censored. Oh, okay. Now, Bill was annoyed by this. I was annoyed by this. I need to do some clearing work in my house quickly. Right. Um, because he said it was too important to conceal it. So he risked being expelled. Mm. And he contacted the Gold Coast Bulletin. See, quite a precocious child even then. But then you find that these high, um, high achieving people are not kind of, uh, they, they do these things. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? They, they don't sort of feel censored they won't be censored yeah, so he, i mean just just on the basis that he's a senator now well then I, he went I, on to be believe boris johnson if he turned around and said oh yeah he see like a bigfoot just down the road he's not going to say so. i think it does lead credibility because of the ridicule you could face Ooh, possibly, you're, yeah. You know, as you get older, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Really? I yeah. Think. I mean, he did this when he was young, obviously. Yeah. Um, when he contacted the Gold Coast Bulletin, and they did run, run an article on it. And I think he was a bit incensed because it was covered up in their school. It was a bit like, "I'll show you, <laughs> you can't censor me," kind of thing. Like I say, it's a bit, you know. Ooh whatever yeah, but yeah the article stands in the gold coast bulletin now okay. he was contacted later on by the 14 times i subscribe to that and he still talks about it to this day i still get it to this day mm, i won't talk about the 14 times um you can borrow mine, Kerry, it's fine. I know, right. <laughs> I'm going to. Don't you worry about that. Now, none of us will ever forget it. You said the subject comes up every time we have a class reunion and we have to reassure each other that it did actually happen. So even now, after his illustrious career, he stands by his story. Yeah. yeah. Well, that sh shows you, doesn't it? I mean, I have heard of that account before that, that, that is one of the, you know, sort of like go-to accounts when people, you know, sort of yowie, sort of like enthusiasts always quote that one. Hmm. It's an interesting one because of who says who's saying about it. You'd think as his career took off, as he got older, he would be more like, nah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I was, I was like, you know, I was thirteen. I was after a bit of notoriety. I contacted the gold bullet and whatever place it was you know what i mean yeah but no nah, he did he still stands by his story and that's yeah. interesting to me yeah definitely. yeah now another account now this actually happened later in the year 2000 august a canberra bushwalker describes seeing an unknown bipedal beast in the brindabella mountains okay Oh, I would like to say that was just two out of the five encounters that that occurred mm. in that five month period. Yeah. Um, others were a bit more wishy washy than that. Um, I believe the one where the dog that got eaten um, was around that same time as well. And they said that was down to dingoes. Yeah. Right. That was part of that five month period. But I, I, I got a bit fed up with that because the rest of the encounters were a bit flimsy. So I then moved on because I want proof here. I want a little bit more 
bones to the meat or meat to the bones, should we mm -hmm. say. So I then went to the Canberra Bushwalker. This happened in August of 2000 in the Brindabella Mountains. Now, this is Steve Piper. Now, this is a videotape and it's known as the Piper film. It's it's a bit like what's the Bigfoot one by the creek? The Gimlin Patterson. Gimlin one. Patterson, yeah, the Patterson film. It's a bit like that in the Australian Outback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again. So you shared that to us as well, and I'll I'll put it up on the group page and Instagram and things. Um, again, I think that's very pixelated. Very much so. It is widely regarded as a hoax. Same as the Patterson film. Yeah. Widely regarded as a hoax. But it's incredibly interesting to me because it moves very similar. It does. Mm -hmm. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. So I don't know about that one. I mean, there's a load of people online that have ripped it to been, shreds. I wonder if it has actually been compared to see whether or not they put the trees over the Gimlin video. So it is actually the same dark entity walking through the woods as opposed to mm. the creek. They look very similar. I'm not going to lie. They do. Just yeah. the setting is very different. Um, I don't know. I, it, mm, it's, it's a very difficult one to call, to be fair, because I don't know enough about film to know about hoaxing and... I don't know enough about Bigfoots and Sasquatches and Yowies to comment on those kind of things. But the more I read about it, the more I saw people going, yeah, it's fake, it's crap, it's this. But we say this about everything, you know. <laughs> you know, even in the paranormal <gasps> field, you know, when 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 anyone publishes anything online, it's ripped to shreds anyway, so, you yeah. Know. As I say, yeah, I mean, I, I would possibly go to, you know, one of the like, SPR or a, an organisation that deals with that sort of stuff. And then when they go, oh, yeah, it's fake, then, yeah, OK, it's fake. I wouldn't listen to, I don't know, Joe Bloggs' paranormal team because their acronym says spells out ghost or something. Mm. You know, their opinion really doesn't make much difference, to be fair. Mm. Because, yeah. Steve Piper stands by it and says that that's what he caught, and it's up yeah. to you what you believe it or not. Basically, mm -hmm. don't give. I don't care. Well, you know what I mean. That's the right attitude to have, isn't it? Really, it's the only attitude you can have when you come up, uh, come up against so much scepticism. And it's so. And we've said this time and time again. It's so easy to rip something to shreds. Mm -hmm. He may well have hoaxed it. I don't know. I don't know the guy. I don't know enough about the subject. In all honesty, other than what I've looked into for tonight's show, I find it interesting the same way I find the Patterson film very interesting. But I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not a expert in any way, shape or form in regards to where would you even start? I mean, you don't just go down to your local um, fancy dress costume shop and get an ape outfit and then mm. I don't know. I, well, that sounds a very good place to start, to be fair. Well, if you're going to hoax something, I suppose that's the only what you would do, or go on Amazon and get a gorilla suit and then get your local fatty to dress it up to pad it out a bit and walk in a funny way. I don't know. I mean, it's possible in the same way as the Loch Ness Monster sighting is possible well, it. that it's an eel, you know, or an elephant. Got, my brother's got a dragon onesie, so I think I'll go out and film him walking through the woods in it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> However, let's have a look at some Yowie hunters. These are people that are believers. Yeah. Okay, Rex Gilroy. Good old Rex. I know Rex Gilroy from old. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We, he's yeah. a paranormal enthusiast. That does not make him a bad person because we are. And if you're listening to this show, that kind of makes you too. He claims to have collected over 3,000 reports of them. There are lots of reports out on the internet, I will say. Yeah. Lots. 3,000, he reckons, he's claimed. 
and proposed that they comprise a relic population of an extinct ape or the Homo species. He thinks it's related to the North American Bigfoot. And he spent 50 years amassing his Yowie collection. Mm -hmm. And he reckons he's identified four different species of Yowie and believes that they're part of the subspecies of the Homo erectus. Mm. All right. Okay. He also thinks he's found evidence that proves North American's Bigfoot is a distant relative of the Australian Yowie. Right. He's written several books on the subject, so he's going to be a believer. Yes, uh, he's written a lot of books as Rx, and uh, some are quite fanciful, actually. But, uh, 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 yeah, but, yeah, well, it's Rex Gilroy for you. Yeah, no, when I was in Australia, I brought a lot of his books and read them. Mm. I missed his Yowie ones, though. Yes. He says that he has Aussie genes and he says in his own words, I'm going to cop flack for saying that, but it's true and I have the evidence to prove it. Mm -hmm. Okay, is all I'm going to say on that one. But if he has collected 3,000 personal accounts of encounters with the Yowie, it suggests something is going on and should not be dismissed as easily as that. In the same way, you would not dismiss a poltergeist case because the evidence, or say evidence in a loose term, the counters that people have had with them doesn't take out the fact that they don't exist. It just says that people are having experiences and can't explain them. 3,000 yeah. accounts suggest people are having experiences and can't explain what this is. Mm. No, that's it. And it makes him sort of an expert in the field because he's studied it for that period of time. And, you know, he, he's got 30,000 reports, uh, 3,000 reports on it. He's, uh, he's probably one of the people I would go to if I wanted more information on the Yowie. Uh, on the Yowie. Mm, one of them anyway. Now, he says the reason so many hunters have tried and failed is because they're looking for a big hairy monster. That doesn't exist. So what is it? Ooh. One hand, he's saying it is a, um, a, a physical evolution from the Homo erectus. And then the next, he's saying that a big hairy monster that doesn't exist. Hmm. Maybe it's more more of a man, hairy man. Mm. You know, could be. And he cites a case of a Homo erectus saying it's an eight foot tall male living in Katoomba. That's just a very large man. Yeah. And we have, I mean, you've only got to look at the world's largest man from the, um, you know, world records. He was a very big man. But that does not make him a Yowie. It makes him a human, a, a homo sapien, well, with just very big Richard genes. Richard Osman, you know, he's uh, <laughs> six foot tall, one eight seven foot tall. He's the British, he could be the British Yowie. <laughs> Doesn't make him a Yowie or a subspecies of the Homo erectus. What it makes him is a very large homo sapien. What it makes sapien. him is ideal to reach high places. Oh, that's exactly what it does. Yeah. Now, he says yeah. that he is a Yowie man, and regardless of science, he spent a lifetime doing it. He knows what he knows, and mm. that's that, really. So yeah. I thought I'd look into Homo erectus, because he brought Homo erectus to the table. Now, mm. this is a species of the human genus, right? So it is a species of human, um, and they reckon it was a modern ancestor of the modern human, Homo sapien. Yeah? Yeah. They think it was, they, they originated in Africa. And this is all yeah. going on archaeological finds. Okay? So scientific, is it then? Yeah. Yeah. It is scientific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now. Most of this is European, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Europe. Right. Okay, so we, we, we're looking at Northern Hemisphere more than Southern Hemisphere, as yeah. far east as Southeast Asia, but not Australia. 
okay? Now, they were medium of stature. They walked upright. Their brain case was low. The forehead was receded. The nose, jaws, and palate were wide. So the brain was smaller, the teeth larger. Yeah. And they think that the erectus were the first human species to control fire. Now, they think this was about a million years ago. Right. The species seemed to have flourished until about 200,000 years ago. And then they think that there was the evolution that went into the Homo sapiens. We right. took we kind of took over from them. Yeah. Right. Yep. No Homo erectus remains. No archaeological information has ever been found in Australia. Okay. There is a second species called the Denisovans. They were known to inhabit that region and and I found this controversial piece of information because there's con there's conflicting um, information on this. Some say that there is evidence to show they interbred with modern humans, and some okay. say there isn't. Okay. Now they reckon there's about five percent of the Aboriginal Australians DNA that does tie-in with the Den Denisovans. Right, oh, okay. So, like, when you look at the evolutionary... Oh, it got quite confusing, I'm not going to lie, but I think it went... Um, when you look at the evolutionary, you had the Erectus, the Denisovians, and then the Homo sapiens. So it's sort of like the yeah. in-between in between ones. <clears throat> at one time, all three of us, or... All, all three of the species all all coexisted, didn't they? To some degree or other in different areas of the world. Yeah. That doesn't mean there was a crossover. Yeah. Okay. As I say, different studies yield different results, but there is not a single complete fossil fragment of a finger or a jaw in Australia of the Denisovians. Right. Denisovans, however you say that word. OK. Yeah. yeah. Now, Paul Cropper, another Australian Yowie researcher, says there have, for his experience, 350 sightings, lots of evidence, but no smoking gun. So he needs a little bit more than a sighting. Mm -hmm. OK. Now, he does say anyone who says it's a hoax or a joke is just wrong. It's more complicated than that. He doesn't know what it is, but he doesn't believe it's a hoax or a joke right so there's something to it he doesn't know what now he does say that this country is crisscrossed by four-wheel drives and no one has hit it with his car or captured clear photographic evidence but we have this with american as well with the sasquatch it's exactly mm. the same scenario yeah. so many people in in yes there are vast areas that aren't populated but they're crisscrossed by people and hikers and climbers and ranchers and all those sort of things. And there's no clear photographic evidence or nobody's captured one or killed one or had any physical verifiable evidence regarding them. But something is going on. Something is happening. People are having experiences. Mm. And we'll talk about them. And he goes back to the Ochi account, the senator account. Right. That's his favourite, is it? Yeah. He says that that is one of the most reliable in recorded history. Right, yeah. And due to the amount of witnesses that went on record. Even, he says, even after, like, 20, 25 years after the event, so you're looking at a 13-year-old lad having an experience and 25 years later he's still saying what he saw and have other witnesses to back him up. Yeah. And he's got everything to lose by continuing to claim this and his story's never changed. So for, for Cropper, it's, it's, that's, a very, that's like a really strong account. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting, isn't it? He says he needs the tissue. That would be yeah. the holy grail, the tissue. 
the the fundamental physical stuff you know a mm. poo or a hair or an actual physical yeah we being caught that would yeah. be the biological evidence to prove the sightings or the experiences mm. people have which they haven't got and they this mystery won't be solved until we have that that's right yeah so he's a little bit more believes but needs a bit more to verify <laughs> oh yeah you know you <laughs> these humanoid creatures if they exist uh yeah it's got it you know and for them to go down in the canon of things of wildlife that does exist you're gonna need a body aren't you need something and unfortunately us humans if there was something out there and somebody did come across one they unfortunately they kind of want a real life body of it and oh, absolutely you know unfortunately for us we're destructive creatures so mm. i do feel sorry for any yeah it's not going to come forward like bigfoot and the hendersons kind of styley where they become <laughs> friends with the family it's not going to happen that way it'll be because someone captures one or kills one if they are what they think well th this is again you know going back to the bigfoot this this is something that was raised on the program that I watch, they said that the American government apparently know about these creatures and they've put them on like an endangered species list. That's why they're so few and far between. And all the land that, or some of them around Washington state, um, is actually being bought up by the American government and made into like nature reserves type thing. So these creatures can live free um without you know without any fear of people coming in and stealing them and chopping their bodies up um but i think if that was the case when the american government knew about them they would have captured one and cut it up some conspiracy theorists would say they did well uh, absolutely they probably yeah but, but, they're, but they're so elusive. I mean, they're pretty much proved they do exist that they <laughs> they don't need any help staying elusive, do they? No, oh. absolutely not. And if it's to be believed <laughs> that they do actually cloak, they don't need any help at all. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so you watch this program. Yep. This Bigfoot hunting, what's it called? Expedition Bigfoot. You both watched that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in that programme, we were talking before we came on air, um, <laughs> and you both talked about infrasound. Yes. That's right. It was one of the theories that um, these creatures, whatever they are, use infrasound um, to paralyse their prey, basically. That's crap. Yeah. Because I looked into infrasound because yeah. of this conversation that we had. Now, first of all, infrasound is um, a range of noises outside the hearing of the average human. Mm -hmm. Right? Which we know about. We know that there are sounds like dog whistle. Think about a dog whistle. You don't hear it, but the dog does. See, yeah. I, I looked into it as well. And it, I think, isn't it 12, um, below 12 megahertz? or something is supposed to be this infrasound mm -hmm. um and it's commonly believed that you can't hear it mm -hmm. but you can depending on your personal hearing uh, there uh, are differences i mean if you're deaf you ain't gonna hear any of it uh, no but also it's differences yeah, between age between well. male and female and there are certain ultrasounds or infrasounds that you wouldn't hear Absolutely. think about bats you don't you, do. you hear you hear certain noises but there are certain there's a lot more going on there that you don't hear yeah you, you can test your frequency hearing um i mean social media has come up with um some sound hearing mm -hmm. tests that you can do to tell how old and young your ears are basically mm -hmm. um and younger people can pick up on higher frequencies than possibly i could but then i could pick up on frequencies that you can't exactly mm -hmm. so 
the sound thing is animals do use different levels of sound that humans do mm -hmm. right like bats echolocation so they don't bump into things in the dark um and communicating over long distances is something else that animals do as well with with yeah. sound think of whales yeah. yeah now the low frequency noises that human ears can usually detect are used by elephants to communicate over long distances so yeah. We know from physical animals that we've got, you know, that we know about and that these frequencies are used by animals, right? Yeah. In many different ways. But they're always linked to communication or territory, not mm -hmm. freezing somebody into something. Do you know what I mean? Uh, isn't it? Um, I think they, they suggest that it um put someone into the fight or flight scenario so it can instill a bit of fear into you you know like what there's something there but i can't see it there was a test done um by if you bear with me richard lord he did a um scientific experiment to show yeah. infrasound and the effects it would have on people. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what they did was because they wanted to see basically if what we experience in an, a paranormal scenario, yeah, would have an effect on people. So they laced music, live music, with infrasound at a London concert hall and then asked the audience to report their experiences and reactions to the music. Yeah. Okay, so infrasound, normally you can't hear it. So they, as far as people are aware, it's just a normal piece of music and then in that music they've got this infrasound. Yeah. Okay. And it was tested on 750 people at this concert. Okay, mm -hmm. so... On the, this was trying to put it to a paranormal perspective um, on a paranormal, would, would somebody have a ex paranormal experience possibly because of infrasound yeah. rather than a Bigfoot or Yowie kind of scenario. But the principle stays the same. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about the fright or flight, that's not the reaction people got. 22% reported unusual experiences when it was in the music. Yeah. But the feelings included just feeling uneasy, sorrowful, they got chills down their spine, or they got nervous, like revulsion or fear. Mm -hmm. So, yes, infrasound can cause a reaction in people, but not the fright or flight that would make you have... But then isn't, isn't that part down to the, um, as reported there, um, the nervous feelings of revulsion or fear... If these creatures can use it as a tool for communication, mm, surely if they want to make you feel sorrow, sorrow, they will be able to do that because they know how to use it. Your... Same with the fear. If they know how to use it, they're communicating that to your brain and your brain's picking up on that and you, you're constantly walking around the woods going, what's that? Who's that? Someone's there watching me. The I thing with that with is it, you're it. putting an emotion onto somebody's experience. These mm. creatures are not using them for an emotive reaction within a human. They're not deliberately doing that. They're just living their life and going about it. Right. So say you was in the African bush and elephants were communicating with infrasound, mm. which they do, which we know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You might feel pensive or sad or uneasy the feelings that you've just described paul yeah that's what i'm saying but you if, wouldn't if, have if your fright or flight that, triggered no but if they're communicating that with other animals other elephants that i oh, know they've had a bad day and they're just <laughs> today you know if they're communicating that with other animals and you're there you're picking up on that but if that elephant decides no he don't want to talk to you uh, anyone else but there's a bloke just over there, and I don't know what he's doing. He's got a big gun pointing at me. I want to use my infrasound to tell him to go forth and multiply. Um, you know, he might try and use that communication to say, sod off, leave me alone. 
or try and scare that person. Do you know, maybe not an elephant, but tigers use it as well. They don't use it in relation to humans, though. That's the point. No, the point people, is people, when animals use infrasound, it's for their experience. You know, it's yeah, for their no, benefit, yeah, no. not the effect it's going to have on a human. But then we use it in the context of a Bigfoot. So who's to say that that Bigfoot isn't feeling threatened by us being there and somehow he's using that communication to ward us off? Yeah, to make you feel uneasy or in some cases even. If, because if they, uh, it is quite are, commonly... If they can poor. communicate using these infrasounds, then it's plausible that they know how to use it and they understand it and no. they're... Assume. No more than an elephant would understand infrasound and their use of it. They just do it. It's part instinctual. Exactly. It's part of their that physiology. No, mm. you've just said that they would use it to make somebody feel scared or whatever. What I'm saying is if it's an animal and it's using infrasound, it's got nothing to do with the human in the vicinity whatsoever. It's just an instinctual thing it does. Mm. It's not designed to scare a human or make us a human fearful it could just be part of its physio physiology your it's almost like you're saying it's got a, making a conscious decision to use infrasound to evoke that reaction he, in a human. He, uh, bigfoot may do that we don't know because we don't know these things we, we don't know anything about them so they may have that intelligence i mean we, we do assume that they are of the ape family because they are very ape-like Maybe they recognise us as a type of ape. Do you see what I'm saying? So they might actually think, let's communicate and tell him to clear off because I don't like him there. I don't think a chimpanzee in the wild would necessarily make that or a orangutan in no, the wild no, would I'm make not, that assumption. Mm. Intelligent animals. If I'm not saying got, they're not intelligent. What I'm saying is I don't food. think that there's that conscious recognition that you're saying no oh, see, i see i i disagree i think they're very intelligent animals and you you do even get gorillas at sign but only because they've been talked to by humans precisely but they still communicate what they want by signing richard yeah i'm sort that's of uh <sighs> The infrasound sort of like debate. I mean, there, there's certainly stories, you know, that people that people that do have uh, in, in, in encounters with uh, with these creatures. Sort of, it does have some physical effect on them. I mean, the sort of like people feeling unwell when when they're in the vicinity, you know, and uh, they get what really really bad headaches, migraines. Mm. Yeah, so, but it's, whether it's directed at the human specifically, uh, you know, but it could, it's, as you're saying, Kerry, you know, it could just be a side, a side effect of this animal's natural behaviour. But on the other sort of side, I mean, as Paul says, I mean, uh, there's there's there is a degree of intelligence i mean these creatures do seem to be very intelligent you know and sort of so mm. what are you basing the fact on that the creatures are intelligent that they they know what humans are do they, they? Provide, they they appear to i mean because they spend a lot of time avoiding us i yeah if i they mean do I, exist i mean they they they're very difficult to track and uh, the times when you do come across them are by surprise you know you sort of stumble on them you know and vice versa and they stumble on on humans but uh, so yeah i mean it's just something we don't know. I mean, but you know, intelligence. I mean, they're prob they do appear to be more intelligent than than 
than your common ape, you know, like chimpanzees or. I mean, if if they are if they are ape creatures of the ape line, then I think they're going to be quite clever. They're going to be intelligent. Um, this whole thing going back to ape signing, they make conscious decisions of what they want to sign, and then they tell you what they want. So they could quite easily tell you, I want that banana and I want to stick it with a Sunday shine. They could sign that, you know. Um, but th- these um, Bigfoot, if, you know, the, if on these documentaries where they show you nests, where they've bedded down, it's quite strategic where they bed down and they make tree structures where they're actually ripping trees from one location and um, weaving them with others to make a like a teepee type of shape in the woods. Okay, I'll argue. I'll argue that point. Okay. If they're making a nest, yeah, and they're slept there, there'll be DNA evidence. There would be that's correct forensic mm-hmm. evidence. Yeah, there isn't. I, on this particular documentary, um, they did take samples. I've not seen what they've got back, but they ha- they do take samples of every every time they find anywhere they think Bigfoot could have been. They have taken samples. One of the actual people in the the group in the program, she um, has discovered um, a creature before, so she's got that experience. She's also an expert in primate behavior Mm. linking it again to the primates um and when they do find these nests you know there's always one nest that's higher than the others because they do tend to find some of them in groups um so they find one higher up which would be your gray back if you're talking about apes and then all the others around Mm. so this gray back can be protecting them Wow, we still have no physical evidence no. to back it up. No, That's, no. Again, it makes an interesting so, discussion and a fascinating adventure if you want to go out and look for a Yowie or a Sasquatch or a Yeti yeah. or whatever it is. Mm. And I have to say there is so much personal experience people have had in all of these areas, all of these different ape-like, you know, creatures, whatever they are. Scientists are still out on this controversial studies done on both sides of the gna Mm. kind of spectrum still haven't got any physical evidence or the tissue um as per se but i it's fun right isn't it fun you know it's like going and hunting the goby death yeah, worm. I would love more Golden Death Worm and that's that's, it things like that. That's another show. (laughs) I'm not saying they don't exist. I can't say they don't exist. I do think you have to look at the whole spectrum from belief system, from um, the natives right down through and see if there's a, I don't know, a link there as to why there are experiences. I mean, if you look at belief systems in, you know, the UK, we have a huge witchcraft belief system, folklore, druid, whatever you want to call it, you know, that that filters down into everybody. Is that why we have experiences? I don't know the answer to the question. That's what makes the paranormal field the umbrella term. We call paranormal is the umbrella term. Cryptos come under this. It's fascinating. And whatever way you want to look at it, I can't argue it either way. I can nah, put facts I mean, on the table and go, yeah, but this is what infrasound is in animals. And I can look at, you know, people's experiences and go, mm, okay, mm, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. There are people that believe wholeheartedly in this. There are people that don't exactly the same as the ghosts and specters and mm-hmm. spirits fascination that we all have as well. Interesting to look at. Last words, boys. Um, yeah, sure, no, I, I, enjoyed I, that. I, I think like um, everything that we've seen, not just on the telly, but in these museums and things, it's all circumstantial. And okay, you know, they pull out Bigfoot um, prints, but that could be anything. 
it's all circumstantial and it just fits the brief, doesn't it? It certainly does. Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, it, it is a fascinating topic. It's always fascinated me. I will always sort of make a big line for a Bigfoot article when they when they come up in my news feed and stuff and always take time out to read it. And it just sort of adds, you know, <laughs> nine times out of ten, you know, it adds more to the mystery than what you yeah. can take away from it. But, you know, it is... Uh, it you know it, it's 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 it makes your brain muscle work i feel it does absolutely. it's an interesting topic i will say that and one that say causes controversy you could argue the point backwards and forth for hours at an end which we've done in the background mm, on that note we have actually come to the end of the show boys. so last things to do is say good nap say good night boys Good night, boys. Good night, boys. I kind of fudged that bit. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Good night.